Before the service started, Josh and I were, were commiserating uh, sort of in the hallway here that you don't recover what we don't recover from jet lag as easily as we used to when we were younger. And I'm sort of in that experience right now. I thought I'd kind of figured it out because when we went to Europe, I had zero problems. Uh, it was just an immediate adjustment for both my wife and I, and then we've come back on Wednesday, late Wednesday, and so I'm on now, I guess, kind of day three of being back, and I feel about 75% human today, which is good, good. Yesterday, I was at about 25% human, so I'm, I'm hoping for a full 100% tomorrow. Um, it's really great to be at the Franktown Church. I always love this church, and it's, it's an honor to be here. Beautiful music, by the way, as is always the case here. Thank you, Carla, for the children's story. Um, I'm going to share with you a, a brand new sermon. I've only preached it twice before. It's called The Roman and the Rich Man. I preached, oh, probably six weeks ago or something at the Kentucky-Tennessee camp meeting. That was the first time I did this sermon. And then at the South England conference camp meeting, which was a really great camp meeting in Massachusetts, and I also did this sermon. And so um, it's new. I'm really excited about it. And, and basically, it just came about because I was noticing the... Uh, similarities, and I'll get into this a little bit later, between one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. This is Jesus' encounter with the Roman centurion, as you might have guessed from the picture. And arguably, Jesus' most difficult parable. Uh, Jesus often taught in stories and what we call parables. And it's, I think, pretty cons- There's a consensus that of all the many stories and parables that Jesus told, one of them stands out as the most difficult, the most problematic. And can anyone hazard a guess what that story might be, that parable might be? Yeah, the rich man and Lazarus, exactly right. And I've always been drawn to that story. I think I like its difficulty, it appeals to me. And as I was sort of spending some time on the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, it got me thinking about this encounter with the Roman centurion. And it's a remarkable presentation that has not yet reached full... I don't think this sermon is everything it's going to be, and the next few times it's going to really become better and better. Hopefully this will be a great one, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So we're going to start with prayer, and then we're going to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, and it's going to be a lot of fun here today. So let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, bless us now as we open the Word. Uh, We really want to hear from you. Lord, I'm going to do my best here uh, with the faculties that you've given me, with the enthusiasm and passion that you've given me, with the voice that you've given me. But Father, at the end of the day, we need something more than human to take place this Sabbath morning. We need the Spirit to show up. And there are people here that are hurting. There are people here that are doing really great. And all kinds of different people in between. Lord, we need a word from you. We need a divine word. And so my prayer is that whatever is needed, that you would tailor make this sermon to individual needs, circumstances, and that you would apply by your Spirit Uh, a message of encouragement, a message of hope, a message of your inimitable love. And may we come away with a better understanding of who you are, chiefly, and a better understanding of who we are and of the world around us. Uh, Father, speak to us now, minister to us now through your word. Is my prayer in Jesus' name, let everybody say amen and amen. All right, join me in Matthew chapter 8, if you would. We've got... uh, our slides here, and I just want to give a big shout out to Jessica for purchasing the new clicker. Uh, the last time I was here, I complained about the clicker, um, and I guess I'm, I, 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 is the message here, Jessica, that when I complain about something, that it changes? Is that the message? Okay, great. I'll try to find something to complain about. All right, the Roman and the rich man, this is going to be a really great presentation. I think you're going to like it. Now, as is the case in a morning sermon like this, a single sermon. Uh, We're coming into a story or stories kind of midway through. It's a little bit like watching a movie. You can imagine a two-hour movie, and we're going to watch just a five-minute segment of it, you know, of the movie. And so it's going to be helpful for us if we spend just a little bit of time talking about how we got to Matthew chapter 8. That's what we're going to be looking at. Jesus' incredible, unexpected encounter with the centurion, but that doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen in isolation. In the sort of unfolding of the story of of Jesus that Matthew is telling, we get here strategically and we get here sequentially and very specifically, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time developing this. This is why uh, typically when I pastor a church, which I'm not presently pastoring a church, but historically when I've pastored churches, I tend to preach series. 
10-part series, six-part series. We even one time preached a a year-long series through the Old Testament. I like that. I like to spend time with the church sort of going deep and ruminating through the text of Scripture rather than just these little one-off sermons, which can be great, but we don't get the depth of thought. We don't get to put the plow deep enough. And so we're going to try and do a little bit of that today, but let's just sort of set the stage. How do we get to Matthew chapter 8? What's happened in the chapters leading up to this? Well, the short version would be Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy, which is kind of an introduction. Uh, Matthew chapter 2 tells the story of the infancy of Jesus and of the uh, death of the young ones there in Bethlehem by Herod. Matthew chapter 3 quickly fast forwards to the adult um, uh, ministry of Jesus. He's baptized. Matthew chapter 4 is the temptation of the wilderness. And then Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 are the longest single sermon that we have in the New Testament, referred to typically as the what? Sermon on the Mount. And it's an incredibly long sermon, right? I mean, three long chapters, all of Matthew 5, all of Matthew 6, and all of Matthew chapter 7. Then we get to Matthew chapter 8, which is where we're going to be momentarily. But the reason that we make this point is that Matthew is doing something very specifically, very strategically in his gospel. He is painting Jesus, he's looking at Jesus through the eyes of the Old Testament and painting him as Israel. And this is crucial to grasp, and that's why I've put a slide up here just to kind of summarize this. From Matthew's perspective, as well as the other New Testament writers, certainly Paul, but for our purposes here this morning, we're concentrating on Matthew, Jesus is Israel. And he is succeeding where the covenant people had failed. And that's the point. That's why Matthew's probably favorite word in his entire gospel is the word fulfilled. And you find him again and again, you know, taking passages from Jeremiah, from Isaiah, from the Psalms, and then saying, this was happened that it might be fulfilled, and then he sort of identifies some incident in the life of Jesus. This happened, that it might be fulfilled, 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 that it might be fulfilled. And when Matthew says that, that all of the sort of overarching history and the story, the narrative, the trajectory of Israel's history is being fulfilled in Jesus, he's not just speaking sort of um, in a punctiliar manner or a, or a haphazard way. He believes that, that Jesus is completing the story that Israel began, right? That, that something is coming to a grand and glorious climax and that Jesus is succeeding where Israel had so often failed. And just as a simple case in point, we can think of the temptation in the wilderness, right? Where, where Jesus is tempted on three points, cause these stones to be made bread, cast yourself down from the temple, bow down and worship me. Each of these three temptations that take place in Matthew chapter four is answered by Jesus with a plain, thus saith the Lord, or an it is written. And in each case, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. It is written, it is written, it is written. And, and the crucial point here is that the book of Deuteronomy was, of course, the very book that was given to Israel to buoy them up and prepare them to inhabit the promised land and to be faithful in that capacity, to be faithful as God's people and as God's missionaries, we could say. Because what God was doing with Israel was not just giving truth to Israel, but more importantly, giving truth through Israel to the surrounding nations. And so, Jesus is the, the, the climax, he is the telos, he is the point to which it was all headed all along, and when we get to Matthew chapter 8, the Sermon on the Mount has just happened, just a, a final word there about the Sermon on the Mount. Six times in the Sermon on the Mount, we find Jesus using this familiar refrain, you have heard, but I say. You have heard that uh, you shall not, uh, you know, commit adultery. Yeah, but I say that whoever lusts after a woman, uh, to looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. We see this sort of intensification, even a magnification of Torah. And, and that refrain, you have heard, or more precisely, you have been hearing, but I say, Jesus here is very obviously taking an adversarial posture to the rabbinical culture, teachings, and leaders of the day. He's setting himself over and against what was sort of uh, commonly taught in the rabbinical schools. You have been hearing, but I say. You have been hearing, but I say. Not once, not twice, six times he says this. So so Jesus here in this incredible sermon that uh, I just love it. It's just one of the great pieces of uh, not only literature, but one of the great pieces of spiritual insight in all of, of the human experience, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus here is setting himself over and against the prevailing religious notions of what Judaism was, what the Messiah was going to be, what God's people were. 
And so when we come out the other side, Matthew chapter eight, this is a crucially important point. Jesus is effectively, as Matthew's telling the story, he is effectively coming down from what we might call the New Testament Sinai, right? He has been atop the New Testament Sinai in the Sermon on the Mount, just as the law was given in the Old Testament by Jesus from Sinai's summit, He has here explicated the law. He has explained the law. You have been hearing, but I say. You have been hearing, but I say. And the law giver is now becoming the law explainer or the law interpreter. Of course, as Matthew records, if you want to just look at the last couple verses there in Matthew chapter 7, uh, just before we get to Matthew chapter 8, the response of the people to Jesus' teaching was one of complete astonishment. They were flabbergasted by what they were hearing. And Matthew records that for us in the last two verses there, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What are some synonyms for astonished? What, what were they? They were, they were what? Surprised. They were surprised, great word. Anybody else? They were shocked, great word. Yeah, they, they, were, they were amazed. And and we don't have to wonder at their amazement because Matthew tells us why they were amazed. His teaching was different. It was fundamentally different, not only in content, but in tone. He taught as one possessing authority. There was a certainty, there was a solidity in the teaching of Jesus, and the people just sort of were amazed at what he was saying. And you can imagine as he brought that uh, sermon to a close with the, with the story that we're all familiar with, the wise man built his house on the rock and the foolish man built his house on the sand. Jesus finishes... And as he makes his way down the mountain, he is effectively descending from the New Testament Sinai. And he is now Israel. The way that Matthew has told the story, Jesus is Israel. He is succeeding where Israel has historically failed covenantally. And what's incredible about this is that as Matthew comes down to the base of the New Testament Sinai, without looking at your Bible, I wonder if anybody knows, what's the very first thing he does? Yeah, he heals, but specifically, who does he heal? He heals a leper. Now, this is really interesting because one of the stories that's being told in the Gospel of Matthew, in all of the Gospels, but especially, I think, in the Gospel of Matthew, is that Jesus is purposefully and sometimes provocatively orienting himself to those that were on the fringes of first century Jewish society. Right? He, Jesus is not recognizing social stratification. He's not recognizing social contamination. He's not recognizing these barriers that existed in first century Judaism. And when he comes down as Israel, the, the very first thing that Matthew records him as doing is touching a leper, uh, jettisoning social convention, jettisoning the, the, the whole sense of social contamination or, or disease contamination, and he heals a leper. I mean, to everyone's astonishment. There is more than just serendipity here. There's something very strategic, something very intentional that's going on in the telling of the story by Matthew, and that is that Jesus is succeeding where Israel had failed, where God had given truth not only to, but through Israel, but they had, as the story is told in the Old Testament, they had increasingly isolated themselves from the surrounding nations, they had been unfaithful to covenant, and therefore God's larger purpose, which was not just a sort of parochial little group of people dwelling in you know, the Middle East or somewhere uh, west of Mesopotamia, but God's plan was that the descendants of Abraham would tell the world, and that, that, that they would be a healing force, that they would be a, a force of light, that they would be a force of change, that they would be a force of education in the wider world. And you get hints of this, like little hints of this in the Old Testament. Joseph and Pharaoh and Daniel in the, in the Babylonian court. And the, you get little hints of what could have been. Uh, the, the queen of the south coming to Solomon to learn about you know, the greatness of the Solomonic Empire. Little hints, but for the most part, uh, Israel largely failed. They, they, they catastrophically failed to fulfill The grand and glorious intent that God had for Israel was not just giving truth to them, but through them. So what's incredible is that as Matthew paints the picture, when Jesus comes down from the mountain, the very first thing he does is this incredible, unprecedented, unexpected act of healing. The next thing that he does is the story that we're going to pay attention to, which is this completely unexpected, unaccountable interaction that he has with the Roman centurion. And and the reason that this story is so remarkable is that no one could have invented this story. Uh, One of the reasons that we can be absolutely confident that the Jesus that's described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is historical and that these documents are reliable is that no one could have written this story in the first century. 
Jesus is perfectly uninventable. No first century Jew, no second century Jew, no third century Jew for that matter, would have written a story about the Jewish Messiah interacting with a Roman centurion like this. The only way we can explain that this, that this story is if it actually happened and an awkward, unexpected, unusual story really occurred and people really witnessed it and they told the story and some later wrote it down. So let's spend a little time on this story. Chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully. Now, I myself have never yet been to the Holy Land. I know that some of you probably have. I haven't been. I'm going to go a little bit later this year, leading a tour with my good friend Ty Gibson. And one of the places that we're going is Capernaum. I can't wait to go there. I can't wait to be in the place where this is. One of my very favorite encounters in all the Gospels actually transpired. And one of the things that you really have to understand in the biblical sort of telling of these tales is that we're often given, very often given, a just sort of bare bones, a kind of skeletal description of what happened, and we're expected as the intelligent readers to fill in the gaps. So let's see if we can fill in a little bit of the gaps here. The centurion approaches Jesus and says, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. The word Lord here is a term of respect. The centurion, by the use of the word Lord, has voluntarily taken a position of subordination. Uh, The word is kurios. It's actually literally the word that would be used for Jesus in terms of Lord. It was the word that was used for Caesar, but it didn't always have to have that sort of, you know, royal monarchical tone. It could just be like a way of saying, sir. It was a term of death a term of respect. And so what's fascinating here is that the Roman centurion is crossing over, uh, a crossing, uh, going across, we should say, a number of cultural and social boundaries to approach a religious teacher at all. And the fact that he approaches him with this specific tone, Lord, this is the tone of, of, of respect and of deference and, as we will see, a tone of, of request. Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. The word here, servant, is slave. And in the ancient world, slave, slavery was common. In all the world, slavery was common until very recently. And we recognize now here today, sitting as we do in this sort of privileged position of uh, 2023, that slavery is wrong, that it's fundamentally anti-biblical, that it's anti-image of God. There's just everything is wrong with it. But the ancient world didn't understand these modern concepts, or if they did, they didn't understand them universally. And people practiced slavery. And you didn't think of slaves or of servants as in any way equal to you. I mean, after all, if they were equal to you, then why had you conquered them? Uh, Clearly, they were inferior to you, and this sort of hierarchicalism with regards to those that ruled and those that were ruled led people to think of slaves as subhuman and to think of them as like what we might regard today as maybe just a fuel source, like oil or solar or some other energy source. Uh, Slaves were the means by which cities were built and temples were built and, and cities were built You didn't regard slaves. Slaves could be easily acquired. And so the idea that the Roman centurion takes this posture of of not only inquiry and respect toward a Jewish teacher, but the, the fact that he's coming on behalf of his servant, a slave, is remarkable. And it gives us a little insight. Again, we're filling in the details on the, on the sort of skeleton here. We're putting some muscle and some skin and some, some, some organs into this story. We're already learning about this centurion. It's a fascinating thing. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, and I love the, 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 the immediacy here, the, the reflexive, I will come. And, and you feel that, that, that when there's a need, Jesus doesn't check with his team you know, he doesn't, he doesn't see how, the, how will this look if I go to the home of a Gentile, home of a Roman. No, no, it's reflexive. It's immediate. Because where there is a need and Jesus is wanted, he goes. I will come. And immediately, I will come. And we should feel the force of that, that Jesus is available. He comes in a moment without any hesitation or consultation. Verse 8. The centurion answered and said, here again, Lord. So the re- repetition of Lord alerts us to the posture of the interaction. Now you can just imagine, this is not 
only Jesus and the centurion. He has just come down from the mountain. We don't know how many people were around Jesus, but there's every reason to believe that there was some large crowd. We know that there were others there because Jesus is about ready to address them, but it's not difficult to imagine that there might have been a hundred or more people there listening in to this interaction. Everybody is waiting, I think, to some degree with bated breath to see how Jesus will respond to a Roman centurion because remember, at this point, nobody knows what kind of a Messiah Jesus is. They have the expectation, the prevailing expectation that Jesus, the Messiah, will be some sort of a military leader, that that he will be the enemy of Rome. And so you can just imagine people sort of looking at one another, how's this going to go? And yet Jesus' reflexive, immediate response, I will come. Oh, oh, there's a need. Oh, there's a situation. Uh, By all means, where do you live? Can we... This would have already been astonishing to, if it's astonishing to us in 2023, what was it in 8030, right? This would have been an astonishing uh, uh, interaction. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and servant will be healed. This is fascinating. We'll come back to that. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Just a brief word about this. The Roman centurion's answer is actually, and Matthew is clearly making this point, is actually the very logical outworking of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has just given perhaps hours before. You might remember that the Sermon on the Mount begins like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means blessed are those that recognize their spiritual poverty. Or we might say, blessed are those that recognize they are unworthy. But well, these are the very words that come out of the Roman centurion's mouth. In other words, whether or not the Roman centurion was there hearing the Sermon on the Mount, it's possible he could have been. It's possible that he could have been there observed. We don't know that for sure, but whether he was there or he had just picked up as many people, as we'll see in the whole of human history, they just pick up that there is a fundamental unworthiness in them that we are poor in spirit, that we are needy, that we have needs. We don't just need a you know, consult. We don't just need a coach. We don't just need an advisor. We need to be rescued. We need to be saved, that something is fundamentally broken in us and in the world, right? So it's possible that the Roman centurion picked this up from the Sermon on the Mount in person, but it's also possible that he had just picked it up in the way that millions of people have picked it up throughout Earth's history, uh, that we have needs and we can't fix ourselves. We are broken, the world is broken. And, and so you see in the Roman centurion's response, I am not, you should come under my roof, quickly followed by, but you can just speak a word. You have here, what I call the two essential elements of salvation. Number one, a recognition of who and what I am. I am unworthy, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then number two, a recognition of who and what God is. God is so powerful. God is so, so consequential that he can just speak a word and the thing will be done. Right, this has a very Hebrew feel to it, right? Let there be light and there was light. And so the Roman centurion in very short order has articulated the two central kind of elements of of Judaism and of the Christian faith. I am not worthy, God is able. I am not worthy, God is able. And just a word about this, I am a man of authority. It's important to understand how the sort of Roman hierarchy worked, how all kind of military hierarchies work. Uh, you have a gradation, right? From the commander-in-chief through the generals to the colonels to the captains to the lieutenants and then the sort of rank and file. The, The way that authority works in these military contexts is nobody possesses authority in and of themselves. They all are just closer to the emperor right, or closer to the commander-in-chief. So, so any authority that they have or any command that they give uh, is, is uh, only an extension of the authority that they are using on behalf of the emperor. And that's actually the point that the Roman centurion is making. He, he's making the point here that, that I understand how authority works, right? I, I give a command, I give uh, a, 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 something that I want done to one of my subservients, and it's done because that's the way that authority works. Authority flows downhill. And so he says, I tell people to go, and they go. And I tell people to come, and they come, which is incredible because it means that the centurion recognizes that Jesus is also an authority figure like himself. Does the centurion fully understand the incarnation? Probably not. It seems likely that the Roman centurion grasps the full sort of ontological, theological significance of the incarnation, but that's not the point. The point is is that he sees some divinity, some glimmer, something in Jesus, 
And let's be honest, he's just desperate. He wants to see his servant, his beloved servant, again, against all cultural expectation of how a man of consequence and of authority would react to a slave. He's desperate. And when people are desperate, they will do desperate things. And so, yeah, his response is, please help me out. And then this, verse 10, when Jesus heard and said to those that followed, the Bible says he marveled. He was astonished. He was amazed. He couldn't believe his ears. This is a very human description of Jesus. And he turns momentarily away from this fascinating interaction that's taking place with the centurion, and he turns to the onlooking crowd. Again, we don't know how many this is, maybe dozens, maybe a hundred or more. But, but this is so incredible. This is so unexpected, even for the Messiah. Jesus, at this point, is 30 years old. He is a keen observer of human beings. He knows how Romans interact with Jews and how Jews interact with Romans. He knows human beings. He understands his culture and he understands it well. And so Jesus was astonished. He was so astonished, as we often are when something incredible Our natural instinct is to tell somebody, you're not gonna believe, I, saw, I just saw the most incredible shooting star. Right? We've seen something, we've experienced something, and we want to tell others. Oh, I read the best book. You have to read it. I ate at the nice... We've had an experience that we regard as extraordinary or surprising or wonderful, we tell others. Jesus is doing that here. Jesus is marveling, he's surprised, and he turns to those and he says, man, I got something to tell you. I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now, this is remarkable because what Jesus is doing here is not only unprecedented, not only, as I've said, uninventable, it's amazing. He is giving the strongest possible affirmation of a Gentile who's a Roman, who's a soldier, who's a leader of soldiers, the very people that are responsible for oppressing your people. How can Jesus speak? with this glowing affirmation about aroma. It's, it's uninventable. The only way that this would be recorded by what historians call the criterion of embarrassment. Uh, the criterion of embarrassment basically means that things that come down to us through historical record that would be potentially embarrassing to the writers or to the cause of the writers, are if they are, if they are found in the text, it's highly likely they're real. Because... Things that are embarrassing to the writers or to the people that are close to the writers, they would redact those things out through successive uh, copying and, ah, that's a little embarrassing for us. The fact that these things survive like this tells us that they're very likely true, just from a strictly historical standpoint. Then we throw in the fact that the Bible is the word of God and we have a thousand reasons to believe. It's amazing that this story comes down to us just this way. No one would have written this story. No one could have invented this. A religious leader's, a Jewish leader's, Jewish rabbi's affirmation, not only like a qualified affirmation of a Roman centurion, the strongest possible affirmation. I've not seen faith like this in all of my people. No Jewish person would put that on the lips of the Messiah. It must have happened. And then he says in verse 11, as if this isn't astonishing enough, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. That's just an idiomatic way of saying, not from here. From over there and over there, many will come from the east and the west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, to further twist the knife, it's not only the affirmation, this unqualified affirmation of a Roman centurion, but to further twist the knife, there's going to be a lot of people like this guy. He's not an outlier is what Jesus is saying. And I have said before, and I've been saying this over the last couple years, that the way that I sort of love to describe what God's plan always has been and is going to be into the future is a godly people inhabiting a goodly land. That was always the plan. That was the plan in Eden. That was the plan plan with Abraham. That's what John sees in the new heaven and the new earth. A goodly land inhabited by a godly people. And that's what Jesus is describing here. Many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What he says next is even more uh, incredible, a a greater twisting of the knife, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing. This is an unexpected reversal of fortune. Those that appear to be proximate will actually find themselves in outer darkness. That phrase, outer darkness, is found only in the Gospel of Matthew, and it clearly means as far away as possible from the light of God's love and truth. So those that imagine themselves 
to be proximate are actually not proximate. Everybody else imagines to be distant are actually great in their faith. So, so it's unmistakable that what we're experiencing here is an is a, is a unexpected reversal of fortune. Those that appear to be in are actually out. And those that everybody would think are out are actually in. Now, we might say that this way today. There are many non-Christians and also many Christian non-Christians. Uh, being in church is a wonderful thing. It's great to be in church. It's great to sing. It's wonder- I love being in church with God's people. But being in a building and wearing the you know, right outfit, if this is in fact the right outfit, is no surefire indication that any of us are in presentation to God. It just means that we're in this building, and it's great to be in this building, and it's great to sing songs. But we are not able to discern, based on mere participation or membership in some external thing that we do, this thing, for example, called church, we don't know if the people around us are actually, now I'm not arguing here that we should be suspicious, but we should be mindful that none of these externalities are the thing that get us proximate to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. So we might say it, that there are many Christian non-Christians and many non-Christian Christians. Verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you, and this servant was healed at the same hour. Now just a brief One of the things that we know about Jesus is that he often went out of his way to speak the language of the people to whom he was interacting. So for example, to Peter, James, and John, who were fishermen, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, To a rich young ruler, he says, follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. You'll have an investment that you can scarcely imagine. I've got an investment you cannot afford to miss. Uh, To a woman at the well, he says, "Um, uh, you, you, you are after water? I have water that will be so so thoroughly effective that it will permanently slake your thirst. Jesus does the same thing here. Hasn't the Roman centurion already said to Jesus, oh, no, no, I'm a man of authority. I'm a man that I understand how authority works. I tell people to go, and they go. I tell people to come, and they come. Jesus then turns away momentarily from that interaction, says all of this stuff to the onlooking crowd about many coming from the east and the west and sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then when he turns his attention back to the Roman centurion... He gives him an order. He speaks the language of authority to a man who understands authority. He literally says, go. Go your way. Why that language? Why that? Well, because Jesus here again is speaking the language of the people so that they can understand, so that they can grasp. And and Jesus was, as Paul later was, uh, kind of chameleonic in this regard, that, that he would adapt to whatever the situation required, as we will see momentarily. Go your way, as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed at that same hour. Now, we've just got to note a couple points here before we go look at the rich man and Lazarus. Incredible. Jesus' shocking encounter with the centurion taps into the two defining passages of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this is a little theological, but come with me on this. The, the, The great story of Scripture is that God makes and keeps a promise to Abraham and his descendants. And that promise is land and descendants. God promises, I'll give you a goodly land that will be inhabited by... People, right? And as we've already mentioned, Israel largely failed to live up and live into that promise. But, but I want you just to see, this is how the whole story begins. Genesis chapter 1 to 3, the story of Abraham. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And then this crucial qualifier, and in you all the families of the earth will what, what this alerts us to is the point I was making earlier, that God was not only to Abraham, uh, you know, to the exclusion of everybody else as a kind of, you know, genetic favoritism or regional favoritism or something. That's, this isn't favoritism. God's not just giving something to Abraham, he's giving something through Abraham, and he tells us that. I'm going to bless you, and through you, I'm going to bless the world. Well, that's the very thing that just happened there a moment Remember, Jesus is coming down from the New Testament Sinai. The first thing he does is he touches and heals a leper. The second thing he does is he gives the strongest possible affirmation to a non-Jew. We're supposed to see in this that just as Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, but largely failed to live into that destiny, Jesus is now a light to the Gentiles. This is absolutely incredible. Uh, here's Here's the second great promise 
in the, in the Abrahamic story, right? You'll be familiar with this. He brought him outside and he said, look now to the heaven. I talked about this the last time I preached in Franktown. We talked about stars and the size of the universe and God's big enough and small enough. Look now toward the heaven, God says to Abraham, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. And here's the crucial response of Abraham. And Abraham what? Believed, believed in the Lord and God counted that belief to him as righteousness. I mean, th- these are the two you can argue that these are the two most important verses in the Old Testament, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and Genesis 15, 6. And both of them come up in this story. Look at it right here. He found such great faith, not even in Israel. And he immediately goes to what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. But look at this. When Jesus sends him on his way, he says, go, again, speaking the language of authority to a man who understood authority, as you have believed. Well, this an echo of Genesis 15, 6, right? He believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. So this is why we began by saying, Jesus is Israel, he is succeeding where the covenant people had failed. Can you say amen? So now I've, I was thinking about this story. I love this story. And truth be told, I've probably said one fifth of the things that are actually really important in this story. I mean, we've just literally touched, touched on 20%. We could do a series on the encounter of Jesus with the Roman centurion, but we've, we've hit the highlights for sure. There's, other, there's a lot more in there, but we've hit the highlights. But now what I wanna do is, is sort of hold that in one hand. So we've got here, I feel like we're sort of established in the, the Roman centurion narrative. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold that with an open hand, and now we're gonna go take a brief look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And then we're going to note the incredible similarities and contrasts. Okay, now let's move through this, but, but before we get to the actual pair of the, of the rich man Lazarus, I gotta show you something. If you have a paper Bible in your hand, you're gonna be hugely benefited if you, if you do this little exercise with me. So go to Luke chapter 15. So if you have a paper Bible, pull it out. It, it's not gonna have anywhere near the same effect on your phone or on an iPad, probably. But if you have a paper, this is really cool, and it will be Twice as cool if your Bible happens to have the words of Jesus in red. Um, if it doesn't, that's okay. It'll still work. But if, if you have, like I see here, the longs, if you have the, the, the words of Jesus in red, this is an incredible little point. Okay. So we're going to get to Luke chapter 16 in just a second. But before we do that, I want to show you something quite interesting. This narrative actually begins back in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. So go find Luke chapter 15, one, verses 1 to 3, and you will notice that it's black right? At least, as, at least verses one and the first half of two are black, okay? So here it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Uh, excuse me, all of this is black. Then Jesus told them this parable. So you'll see that's all in black. There are three groups of people. Now, Luke doesn't say this expressly, but you get the sense here that this is probably taking place at a meal table, because so many of the incredible encounters in the Gospel of Luke take place at meals. Of all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke emphasizes the importance of eating, the significance of eating. It's, it's, uh, scholars have noted that meals show up prominently and significantly. They're featured that way in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke doesn't say this, but in my mind's eye, when I see this scene here, Jesus is reclining at a, at a dinner table. They've probably just eaten either lunch or dinner and they're having conversation afterward. There are dozens of people present, perhaps as many as 100. And there are three groups of people. You can sort of divide up the people that are present in this encounter. It might've been at a meal, I think it likely was, but whatever the encounter was, wherever it was, there were three groups of people. How many groups of people, everyone? Three. So group number one is the sinners and tax collectors. Right, they are increasingly being drawn to Jesus. He is, as we've already seen in Matthew chapter, he talks like nobody else talks. He behaves like nobody else behaves. People are drawn to him for a variety of reasons. His tone, his content, his healing, his stories. I like to imagine probably his sense of humor. There are certainly things that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, that were funny and were designed to be funny and are unmistakably funny. Jesus was an attractive person. If Jesus walked into this room right now, you would be drawn to him. Uh, there's just people that have that. Uh, charisma, or the kids would say today, riz. It's a short version of charisma. And it, 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 the people that you're drawn to, people that, that have that something, that, that whatever it is, Jesus had that. People were drawn to him, not because of his good looks or his you know, uh, sort of social media stature, because there was no social media. He was just a, 
an attractive figure, a drawing figure. And so the sinners and tax collectors are drawing near. That's one of the groups. The other group is obviously the disciples who are always at Jesus' side. And then the other group is the religious leaders. So those are the three groups here. Very important to understand this. So Jesus then in Luke chapter 15 tells three parables. Uh, These are well-known parables. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son the parable of the prodigal son, which is the greatest of all Jesus' parables, in my opinion. There's just no story in terms of the parables of Jesus better than the prodigal son. It's, it's the greatest of the great, in my opinion. Well, who specifically are these three parables told to? Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Well, we don't have to wonder. It, it's spoken to the tax collectors and sinners, which, which makes sense. These were the outcasts. The, these were the ones that were on the fringes of first century Jewish society, and Jesus tells three sequential parables that are, that are so encouraging. It's gonna be okay. There was a woman and she lost a coin, but it was found. And there was a sheep and the shepherd lost the sheep, but the sheep was found. And there was a man and he had a son and the son was lost, but the son was, was found and he was restored. It, it's gonna be okay, Jesus is saying. It's going to be okay. And Jesus tells this series of parables to this specific group of people, the sinners and tax collectors that are gathering around. Now, of course, the disciples are listening in, as are the religious leaders. But don't worry, Jesus isn't going to leave them out in your Bible at Luke chapter 16, verse 1, because the rest of Luke chapter 15 is all red. It's all red. If you ever read it, you just go look. It's all red until you get to Luke chapter 16, verse 1, and then you get a little, a little sliver of black, and here it is. He also said to his disciples, and then you have a lot of red, And Jesus tells a very interesting parable specifically to his disciples. And this is a parable about, depending on your translation, it's variously called the unjust manager or the dishonest steward. This is a story about a guy who had been put in a managerial position by a wealthy employer, landowner. And the the manager was unfaithful in his stewardship capacities. Well, who's Jesus telling this parable to? We don't have to wonder. This parable is specifically for who? Why a parable about being unfaithful with stewardship and with, with trust that had been given to you? Why for the disciples? Because that's exactly what was happening with the disciples. They were being put in trust with something of great consequence. And what he was saying is the story, the point of the story is be faithful with, with what's being given to you because there will be a day of reckoning. Now, Could the sinners and tax collectors also listen in? Of course. Could the religious leaders also listen in? Of course. But these parables are targeted to different audiences. The lost sheep, lost coin, lost son were for the sinners and tax collectors. The parable of the unjust steward was specifically for the disciples. And now watch this. You get a whole bunch of red and then you get a little black. A little narrative. And here's the black. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of what? Money, they heard all these things. What things? Well, the stories that he just finished telling. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, unjust manager. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things. They derided him. He said to them. To who? To the religious leaders, to the Pharisees. And guess what? The story of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay, now what's so crucial about this is if we understand who the audience is, we are way ahead of the curve in extracting what the meaning is. In other words, Jesus didn't tell the story of the rich man and Lazarus primarily to the sinners and tax collectors. No, Jesus didn't tell the story of the rich man and Lazarus primarily to the disciples. No, they had their own parables that were targeted to them. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, targeted to the sinners who were struggling, holding on, struggling to hold on to some hope that things were actually going to be okay because they lived in a context and in a society and in a religious world that put them on the outside looking in. And Jesus said, no, it's going to be okay. No, no, the lost is found. It's recovered. It's restored. There's a great party. We pay this attention to the disciples because they're in a sort of pedagogical relationship with Jesus. They're learning. They're growing. They're understanding. And Jesus says, hey, this stuff that you're learning, the crowds come and listen for a day, but you're with me every day. You're with me day in, day out. You eat what I eat. You, you sleep near the campfire. You're, you're getting a lot more. I've, I'm putting you in trust. You're my manager's. Be faithful. But this parable, this most difficult of all of Jesus' parables, was told specifically to religious leaders. And it's fascinating in this context. Let's read it. Okay, here we go. Crucially, this parable was told specifically to the Pharisees while the disciples and various listened in. Now, just a quick 
Just a quick point here on this story that Jesus tells, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And this is a a, a brief excerpt from a great book, by the way. It's a book called The Geography of Hell and the Teachings of Jesus by, it's a very difficult last name to pronounce, and I'm only guessing here, Kim Papayoanu? Papayoanu, maybe? And I read the book, incredible. It's It's a scholarly book. He basically goes through every time Jesus talks about hell in the Gospels. And I loved the book and only later found out that it was written by a Seventh-day Adventist. I had no idea. The book is incredible. It's a great, if you're interested in understanding the, the teaching on hell in the Gospels, there's no better book, in my opinion. And he spends a chapter on the rich man and Lazarus, and he makes this really fascinating point, that this story that Jesus tells of the rich man and Lazarus was a, was a, a genre of story that was common in that time. Okay, so let's listen to what he says. A number of ancient tales from a variety of sources dealing with the afterlife contain close parallels to our parable. The motif of a reversal of fortunes for rich and poor after death belonged to the common culture of the Mediterranean world that in ancient cultures, tales of revelations from the dead were common. We can therefore safely conclude of the rich man in Lazarus is told, the audience is probably familiar with accounts of reversals of fortune after death or of revelations from the dead, which circulated widely, crossing linguistic and cultural barriers. So this is Kim Papayoanu's way of saying, he didn't invent this story out of whole cloth. There was a genre of folkloric tales that had, the, and we actually have some of these. We have extra biblical copies of some of these stories, and they bear some of the same features where somebody dies, and when they die, what they thought was going to happen isn't what happens. And then the, the moral of the story is, behave wisely. And so what Jesus does here is he takes this genre, this folkloric genre of tale, and he is going to utilize it for the purposes of making a very specific point to a very specific group. And that is, in this case, the religious leaders, the Pharisees that are listening in. And some of these points are so absurdly exaggerated that we can be certain that Jesus is taking, again, this genre of story and putting an unmistakably Jewish twist on it. And the story, it's, it's funny, actually. It's tragic and sad and difficult, and, but there are unquestionably humorous elements in the story. Let's read through it. So Jesus says, there was a certain rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen luxury every day. Okay, purple in the ancient world was a very expensive color. There were only two sources of purple in the sort of Jewish world. It was from like a strange oyster, and the other was from an unusual tree that was from an area far uh, east of the Middle East. So if you had purple garments, it was a little bit like having, you know, a Rolex watch or driving a, you know, a, a really fancy car. It was a social signal. Uh, so Jesus dresses this man in purple and fine linen and says he lives in luxury, so nobody has to wonder what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a healthy, wealthy Jew. Okay, now if we're dealing with a healthy, wealthy Jew, then we are dealing with somebody who is unquestionably in the good graces of Yahweh. I mean, there has to be. Number one, he's a Jew, so he's already under the sovereign, you know, grace of God, the goodness of God, the favor of God. But the fact that he's wealthy is a further evidence of his fine standing with God and the fact that, you know, he's healthy, as we will see. So, so, so what has to be explained to an audience in 2023 would have been immediately grasped by everybody in the first century Judaism. When Jesus says there was a certain man and he wore purple and fine linen, and he fared, you know, luxuriously every day. Everybody goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, we know. We, we know who you're talking about. Not any specific person, but we know the kind of thing that's being described here. Verse 20, and at his gate, in contrast, was laid a beggar. Ah, okay. Lazarus, now Jesus gives several details here that make the point, that twist the knife, that exaggerate the story. So you're supposed to go, ooh, ee, especially in contrast with the man that's wearing purple. This is a whole different kettle of fish here, covered with sores, e, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, and even the dogs, an unclean animal to be clear, came and licked his sores. All of these details of the beggar are calculated to create a revulsion in first century Judaism, especially for the religious leaders that were fastidious about social contamination, unclean and common things. I mean, a, a man who doesn't even have a home, who is covered in sores, and the dog's so distraught, he's so down and out, that he doesn't even shoo the dogs away. I mean, it is a picture of, of the, you know, sort of 
paragon of Jewish virtue and prosperity and as down and out as you can be. Okay, so again, Jesus didn't invent this story. This is a story that was very much in keeping with this genre of story. So it was when the beggar died that he was carried by the angels into Abraham's or we might say into the warm embrace of Father Abraham. Well, this is unexpected. Because where the first man was a healthy, wealthy Jew, the second is clearly, at some level, under the curse of God for some thing he's done or hasn't done. We see intimations of this in the Gospels. In John chapter 9, when a blind man is found, the disciples question Jesus. Why is the man blind? Because he sinned or because his parents sinned? The expectation was, if you were a healthy, wealthy Jew, you were doubly, triply under the favor of God. And if you were a down and out beggar who was having dogs lick your open sores, you were under the curse of God. And so, when the, the death happens of the uh, beggar, he's taken right into the warm embrace of Abraham. Oh, how did that's not what we would have expected. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, which is the, the, the Greek word for the, the netherworld, for hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off. Well, well, this is purposefully a contrast. One is in the warm, familial Abraham, and the other sees Abraham at a distance. But this isn't what we would have expected. We would have expected the rich man to be in the warm embrace of Abraham and the beggar to be far off. And he sees Lazarus in his bosom. So he called and he said, Father Abraham. Not just Abraham, but Father Abraham indicates a position of trust and of familiarity. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Well, isn't this rich? He's asking help, not primarily from Abraham, but from the, the beggar. Send the beggar to help me. And uh, as we will see, this isn't what's going to happen. But Abraham replied and said, son, remember that in your lifetime, you had all the good stuff. But Lazarus, he was laying at your gate and dogs were licking his open sores. He had all the bad stuff, but now he is comforted and you're in agony. And, and this is this reversal of fortune tale that was common, a, 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 a common genre in the larger Mediterranean world. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm. That great chasm is the permanence associated with death. That, that, that death is permanent. That, that there is some sense in which your character is fixed at death. Your, your actions are fixed. Your destiny is fixed. There's a great chasm between us set in this place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor anyone cross over from there to us. And he said, no, 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 I beg you, Father, send Lazarus at least to my family. I have five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Now, this is a real punchline here. Abraham advises Lazarus, excuse yes, advises the rich man, rather, that the solution to the dilemma is not in some miraculous, you know, post-death crossing of a chasm. The solution is in Torah. It's in the Old Testament. That they have the Old Testament. They know what's right. And, and yet the rich man protests, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone went to them from the dead, they would repent. And he said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be converted even if someone rises from the dead. Now, of course, this is pregnant with significance because a man named Lazarus will literally rise from the dead and will, will not be received and understood and appreciated. In fact, strangely, uh, incredibly, they'll plot to kill Lazarus. Okay, but, but, the, but the point is unmistakable. When Jesus speaks to the, to the tax collectors and the sinners, he says, lost sheep and lost son. When he speaks to the disciples, he tells a very specific story about managerial responsibility and being faithful with the resources that have been committed to you. But when he tells a story to the Jews who imagine themselves to be proximate to Father Abraham, who imagine themselves in the story to be the rich man, he tells a story of total reversal of expectation and fortune. What you think is happening is not happening. Now, the story is called The Roman and the Rich Man, and let's just go through. You might want to take a picture and you can go look at this on your own. You might come up with more. Let's just look at, at eight similarities between these two encounters, right? Because we've got the Jesus interaction with the Roman centurion in one hand, and now we've got at least a cursory understanding of the rich man and Lazarus. So we're gonna, now we're just going to make some observations quickly. Number one, the Roman centurion humbly crossed cultural lines to help his servant. 
We made that point. That, that slaves were throwaways. And yet he goes across social, cultural, religious barriers for another. He significantly inconveniences and perhaps even embarrasses himself for another who is below his station in life. Number two, he respectfully and reverently calls Jesus Lord. Number three, he understood and confessed his own unworthiness. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only speak the word and my servant will be healed. Number four, he affirmed Jesus' authority and ability to heal. Number five, and I put a question mark here because I can't say this exactly for sure, but I think it's possible that you almost pick up kind of between the lines that the Roman centurion was a little uncomfortable with his own authority and position. I, I read that. I read him as going, look, uh, I'm a guy that tells people to go and they go, come and they come. Uh, you can do the same. Whether he's uncomfortable with it or not, he certainly understands how the authority snowball rolls downhill. Number six, he demonstrated great faith, indeed Abrahamic faith. Number seven, he was unqualifiedly affirmed by Jesus. I've not seen such great faith even in the whole of Israel. And then finally, he obeyed Jesus' command to go. That's a fair summary of that story. Now let's contrast that with the rich man. The rich man who by every expectation would have found himself post-death in the warm embrace of Abraham actually finds himself in Hades in torments crying out on behalf of his family. Number one, he did not help a man who was literally at his front door. Stepping over the man to go to his religious meeting, no doubt. Stepping over the man, perhaps even wishing him a a happy God bless you or a, a happy Sabbath, brother. We're supposed to feel that, that he has the resources to help, but he doesn't. It's inconvenient, it's problematic, he's got more important things to do than to help this poor beggar. My station in life is such that God has blessed me, and your station in life is such that you have not been blessed. I must get to my religious meeting, thank you. Number two, he did not help a man who was below him, unlike the Roman centurion, who did exactly that. See, we have to understand why Jesus would say, I've not found faith like this in the whole of Israel. It wasn't just that he said, speak a word and my servant will be healed. It's that he came at all. It's that he came at all. He came on behalf of another. It would have been a different situation if the Roman centurion had come on behalf of himself, which would be understandable. But the fact that the Roman centurion came on behalf of another who was lower in his station in life is the gospel. That God has come on behalf of others whose station in life is lower than his own. The Roman centurion is not just saying words. He is embodying and actioning the gospel. Not the rich man, though. He's stepping over. The, ooh, that's, ooh, they might want to get a band-aid on that. That's gross. Number, he did not use his considerable resources to help others. Where the Roman centurion obviously did. He used his position, he used his ability to move freely and easily in Roman, uh, Greco-Roman society to approach a Jewish man and to inquire and to ask. He, he leveraged his, his position and his opportunity for another, but not the rich man. Number four, he was therefore not a good steward of his resources. Number five, he trusted his relationship to Father Abraham to save him. For all we know, the Roman centurion didn't even know who Father Abraham was. We have no reason to believe that he did. But what we can be certain of is that Jesus said, many will come from the east and the west. Oh, are you surprised by this? Are you scandalized by what I've said about the Roman centurion? I got news for you. Many will come from over there and over there. And they will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. People will meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom who never heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they embodied the great gospel promise of blessing to bless, helping to help, serving to serve, ministering to minister. Number six, he represented hierarchical and pharisaical thinking. This hierarchical thinking that there's the haves and the have-nots and this sort of modern phenomenon that we're all accustomed to, the middle. We live in a stratified world. We live in a hierarchical world, economically, educationally, sometimes racially. We live in that world. Jesus didn't live in that world. Jesus saw, with him, external distinctions weighed nothing, to quote Ellen White. He didn't see rich and poor. He didn't see Jew and Gentile. He didn't see Samaritan and Jew. He didn't see male and female. He saw people. 
And when he saw people that had needs, he said, oh, I will come. Oh, I, oh you have a need? I will come. It's, it's incredible to understand how much these stories are dissimilar. He represented pharisaical and hierarchical thinking. Number seven, he did not understand and practice his own Abrahamic faith. The contrast, of course, is that the Roman centurion did practice an Abrahamic faith, even though, so far as we know, he didn't even know who Abraham was. And then finally, he experienced an, a, an unexpected reversal of fortune. And, and this is the punchline I want to make here as we close. Both passages conclude with a rather unexpected reversal of fortune punchline regarding who is really in and who sadly is really out. And just as a reminder, these stories are common with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Well, what's the expectation? We're in. We prophesied in your name. We, hey, 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 Jesus, hey. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Okay, so this reversal of fortune, this reversal of expectation is not the exception. It's the rule in the teachings of Jesus. Woe to those of us that are just sure we're in. It doesn't mean that we're not in if we think we are. It means that we have to be mindful that the easiest person to fool is yourself. The easiest person to deceive is yourself. It's one thing to go through the motions and to wear the clothes and to possess the accoutrements of religion and an entirely different thing to have the substance and the life and the soul of religion, which is going out of your way to help to bless, to serve, using your resources such as they are, maybe financial, maybe uh, professional, uh, maybe social, whatever. We all have things that we can leverage for the kingdom. And there are people below us in our station in life. And as a rule, it's not always the case, but as a rule, it's easier to minister down because the people below our station in life look up to us. And so we have leverage, we have social capital. We sometimes have actual capital. But the thing we don't want to be doing is stepping over people that have actual needs on the way to church so we can sing Marching to Zion. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 25. This is the grand climax of Matthew chapter 24 and 25 where Jesus says to the sheep and the goats, you're on the right and, and you're on the left. And hey, wait, 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 hey, how, wait. When did we see you naked? When did we... When did we feed you? When did we visit you in prison? Both of these are reversals of expectation. And, and the message for us here this morning is that there is just no need to be surprised on that great day. Amen? There's just no need. It's okay. I'm not saying it's hard or it's difficult. No, no. We just shouldn't trick ourselves into thinking that we're something that we're not. The, 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 the substance of religion far exceeds the accoutrements of religion, the show of religion, the culture of religion. We want to be like Jesus, helping to help, serving to serve, ministering to minister. How can we lift others up rather than just imagining that because we keep the Sabbath or whatever it might be, we're going to waltz right? Let these stories be a warning to us that those that look like they're out might actually be in. And those that look like they're in might actually be out. And let us cry out to Jesus and say, Jesus, save us from this great sin of Laodiceanism whereby we think we're something that we're not. Amen? Talk about a reversal of fortune. You think you're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, but you're actually poor, miserable, blind, and naked. We want to bear ever in mind that opening Beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that recognize their spiritual poverty because heaven is for people like them. And so, Father, we cry out today. Let us pray together. Father, we cry out today that we are not worthy. That we are not worthy to have Jesus come under our roof. But, Father, we are so happy that Jesus and you are the, the, the kind of divine figures, God, in fact, that can just speak a word and change the situation. That can just speak a word and a healing, a salvation, a transformation, a restoration, a rescue can take place. Father, forgive us where we have thought incorrectly about religion. Forgive us where we have 
been willing to substitute the shadow of religion for its substance. Lord, it's a great thing to be in the house of God today, to sing songs and to wear nice clothes. Amen. It's great. But Father, help us to not be stepping over people that we could be helping to get to our religious meetings. Father, teach us what it means to give and to live sacrificially. That's going to look different for each one of us, Lord. And as I prayed at the beginning, Lord, I pray that your spirit would make individual application, Lord. I, I, I don't know the applications. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know the situations, but you do. And may your spirit speak to us and tell us to not be satisfied with the show of faith, with the culture of faith, with the veneer of religion. But Father, may we have its substance. May we be among those that, like Jesus, helped to help, ministered to minister, served to serve, was blessed to bless. And this is our prayer, Father. Make us an instrument of that very blessing is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen and amen.